Good morning and bonjour. Welcome to the seventh session of Gwilym Online, Women's Intellectual and Material Culture. Bienvenue à la septième présentation du projet Gwilym Virtuel. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that even though we are meeting in the indefinable space of the internet, we are tied to our particular places. McGill University is situated on the traditional territory of the Kani and Kehaka, a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst nations. We recognize and respect the Kanye and Kehaka as the traditional custodians of the lands and waters on which we meet today. My name is Lauren Williams and I'm the Blackerwood Librarian at McGill. I'm delighted to welcome you to this event today. For those of you joining us for the first time, this is the seventh session in a series of nine webinars exploring the unpublished correspondence and artwork of Lady Elizabeth Gwillem and her sister, Mary Simons. The two women moved to India in 1801 when Elizabeth's husband, Sir Henry Gwillem, was appointed a judge in the Supreme Court in Madras. The Gwillem Project, Women, Environment, and Networks of Knowledge and Exchange in the Company Raj, is a research initiative of the Rare Books and Special Collections branch of McGill Library in Montreal and funded through the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada and the Shastri Indo-Canadian Institute. The Blackerwood Collection at McGill holds paintings of birds, fish, and flowers by Elizabeth Gwillem, while Mary Simon's wonderful portraits and landscapes are held by the South Asia Collection Museum in Norwich in the UK. The sisters' rich correspondence to family and friends is held at the British Library. The project brings together, not only brings together virtually the Gwillem archive, but also an international network of scholars from diverse fields in Canada, the UK, India, and the United States. A special welcome to members of the research network joining us today. We would like to thank all those who have made this event possible, in particular, Dr. Anna Winterbottom, our symposium coordinator. Anna and I will be watching the chat today. And if you have any problems viewing the webinar, please just send us a message in the chat. The webinar is being recorded and you will be able to view it later on YouTube. We will be sending the link as well as information on upcoming presentations in the Gwillem Online series to all who registered. It is my pleasure now to introduce the moderator for today, Dr. Tulika Gupta. She is a researcher and educator in the field of clothing, textiles, crafts, and design. And since April 2017, is the director of the Indian Institute of Crafts and Design in Jaipur. She has a PhD in the history of arts with a focus on dress and textiles from the University of Glasgow, a master's degree in textiles and clothing from Lady Irwin College in New Delhi, India and has been associated as a PhD fellow with the Center for Textile Research in Copenhagen, Denmark. She started her career as a designer in 1996, moving into design education as a faculty member at NIFT New Delhi in 2005. Her focus moved on to material culture research and design research when she went to Glasgow to do her PhD. Realizing the need for promotion of indigenous research and bringing it closer to interested people, she, along with many like-minded others, set up the Textiles and Clothing Research Center in New Delhi in 2016. She is currently the secretary of the TCRC and has also been nominated as the member of CII's National Committee on Design in 2019 and 2020. Tulika will introduce our panelists and will be posing your questions to the speakers at the end of their presentation. Please use the chat function to ask your questions. Thank you all for attending et je vous souhaite une bonne conférence. Over to you, Tulika. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you for the introduction. Hello, bonjour and namaste to all the listeners who've joined us from different parts of the world. I have the pleasure to introduce our speakers today and to moderate the session. Our first speaker for the webinar is Dr. Rosemary Raza. After graduating from Somerville College, Oxford, she became a career diplomat in the British Foreign Service. She resigned on marriage to Rafi Raza and returned with him to Pakistan, where he served as a federal minister in the cabinet of Zede Bhutto. From the late 1970s, she lived with her family in London, where she pursued her interests in antiques art and journalism. In the early 1990s, she returned to Somerville College to undertake a DPhil on British women writers on early colonial India. She now researches and writes on the subcontinent, particularly on the art and work and lives of the women writers, and has contributed to the new dictionary of national biography. 
Today, Dr. Raza will be speaking on the intellectual and cultural world of Elspeth Quillam and Mary Simons. Her paper seeks to situate the sisters Elspeth and Mary in the wider context of the world in which they lived. They were both talented artists, keen observers of the Indian scene, and fluent letter writers. How did they fit into the role which evolved for women in the 18th century? And were they exceptional? How did their interests and work compare with those of contemporary women? So I hand over now to Dr. Raza for the wonderful lecture. Dr. Raza, please. Uh, uh, Dr. Raza, can you please switch on your audio? Is your that audio? all right now? Yes, yes. please. Thank you can you. hear me now. Thank you. Thank you, Talika, very much for that introduction and, and placing my, my talk um, in, in its context. As you said, it's very much about context. I want to see the, the sisters against the, the background of the people with which they, they lived. And first of all, I'll go back a bit to the foundation of the East India Company in 1603, when a substantial number of women went to India, mainly from a working or lower middle class background as wives, but were often traders and workers in their own right. But by the 18th century, the changing role of the East India Company in administration and military engagement led an increasing number of officers going out from middle class and upper class backgrounds with much more educated wives. Now these women uh, with their different interests and capacities shaped the female experience of India and helped report it to the world back at home. Another factor is the concept of the polite society which developed in the 18th century. It embraced both men and women who were expected to be acquainted with literature, art and the natural sciences. Although girls did not usually have the same education as their and creators, and magazines often written especially for them provided a wide range of information. Meanwhile, the female blue stockings, who encompassed people like uh, Elizabeth Montagu and Elizabeth Carter, claimed intellectual recognition for women. Interest in the life and culture of lands overseas had been stimulated by worldwide exploration. An extensive range of ethnographic and other material had been documented which provided a template for inquiry in other parts of the world. From the later 18th century, women in India like Margaret Clive and Margaret Falk explored mathematics and astronomy. Margaret Falk also collected Indian songs and music as did Elizabeth Plowden in Lucknow in the, 80, in the 1770s and 80s. Elizabeth and Mary fitted into this type of world. We know nothing of their formal education but they came from the newly emerging middle class. Their father was an architect and sculptor and their mother was competent to take over her husband's business on his death. Whatever the nature of their formal education, the Amelia encouraged the sister to take a keen interest in the life and culture of India. But of course they weren't alone in this. Such interest had earlier parallels evident in women's correspondence or published writing. Jemima Kindersley published her letters in 1777 in which she described a wide range of Indian life. She framed her discussion of the Muslim world within the thought of the French enlightenment writer Montesquieu, thereby adding a touch of the blue stocking herself to her account. Maria Graham, who, in, who visited India in the first decade of the 19th century at roughly the same time as the sisters, was an intellectual as well, who acquired the nickname Metaphysics in Muslim in the Society of the Scottish Enlightenment in Edinburgh, and with a trained mind, wrote an extensive account of Indian religion and culture. In the following decade, she was followed by other women like Marian Postons, who lived in Western India and Sindh, and Fanny Parks, who lived in Northern India, wrote extensively about many varied facets of Indian life. Such pursuits required learning local languages, and we know from her letters that Elizabeth studied Telugu, and in fact, she could write it too. This again falls into the pattern already established. Lady Henrietta Clive, an aristocratic Welsh lady married to the governor of Madras, studied both Persian and Hindustani, while Maria Graham learned Persian. 
Marian Poston spoke even more languages, Kachi, Hindustani, Sindhi, and Persian, and Fanny Parks also spoke Hind uh, Hindustani and Persian. The readiness to learn Indian languages was a reflection of how seriously some women took their engagement with India. While the interests of many women I've mentioned encompassed what can generally be described as ethnographic, there was one science which women made very much their own in the 18th century, and that was botany. It had been greatly enhanced by the creation of a universal system of classification by the Swedish botanist Carl Linnaeus, first published in 1735. Women had long established roots in the plant world, if you can forgive that pun. They had gradually grown and gathered plants for medicinal purposes. And from the 17th century, many richer women were involved in the growing craze for gardens. The Duchess of Beaufort amassed a vast collection of plants, many of them specimens from overseas, including India. While Lady Amelia Hume, who was the wife of a director of the East India Company, imported plants from India and China for their famous garden. As we can see from the sisters' letters, they were involved with the other end of the plant trail, supplying seeds and plants to be sent home to friends and nurserymen. Elizabeth was a serious student of botany, which he saw as essential to an understanding of Hindu religion and culture. But again, they were not the first women to be interested in plants. One of the earliest women botanists to arrive in India was Lady Anne Monson, who joined her military husband there in 1774. A friend and correspondent of Linnaeus, she was credited with helping him in the translation into English of his 1760 edition of Philosophia Botanica. While in Calcutta, she made several expeditions into the surrounding countryside to collect plants. Lady Henrietta Clive collected specimens on her astonishing thousand mile exploratory tour around India in 1800, which she too sent home for propagation. In Madras, she established a complete collection of the plants of Mysore and the Carnatic. Further aristocratic ladies displaying a serious interest in botany included Lady Sarah Amherst, wife of the governor general from 1823 to 28, and her daughter also Sarah. Well, in, in 1827, while they were staying in Simla, they explored the surrounding hills looking for new plants, which were sent to Dr. Wallach, the director of the Calcutta Botanic Gardens. And I think uh, Kate is going to touch on the, the Amherst a little later in a different context. While botany was the female science par excellence, the wider natural world was also their home. A later writer, Emma Roberts, published a guide to living in India in 1839, in which she suggested that for women, a love of natural history opens up endless fields for those who have enjoyed a taste for it and urged the establishment of menageries and museums. As we know, Elizabeth became fascinated by birds and Mary particularly by fish, which she il illustrated. And now could we have the first image please? which is a picture with a painting, a lovely watercolor done by Mary of the bird catchers who, who went out to catch the birds, and brought them back for Mary to paint. That's a very delicate and sensitive rendering of them. And the next uh, picture, please. That is Mary's painting of fish, which is a very, very striking pattern there. Again, though, they were, not, they were not original in this sort of interest. Lady Impey, wife of the Chief Justice in Calcutta, kept birds and wild animals in their garden in the late 1770s and 1780s, while in 1794, the wife of General Ellica in Bengal was reported to have a, an amazing apiary of Indian birds containing rare species. Lady Henrietta Clive also established a menagerie in Madras, adding to its inmates in the course of her tour of the South. Recording new discoveries was an essential part of exploration. Visual images were a basic requirement and many employed trained artists. Lady Monson brought a draftsman with her to India. Many more employed Indian artists. It was suggested to Mary that her paintings of ship fish should be copied by an Indian artist just in case they were lost in transit home. But many women turned in the first instance to Indians. In the 1770s and 80s, both Mrs. Wheeler and Lady Impey in Calcutta commissioned Indian artists to paint 
plants, birds, and animals, and for decades, women record buying such paintings from local artists. Could we have the next image, please? This is, this is a, a, a lovely painting from Lady Impey's album, which is done by the very well-known Indian artist, Sheikh Zainaldeen in 1778. Um, you can see how the Indians were being trained actually in, in the, botani the, the, the techniques which the British required for scientific illustration, but at the same time, you will have a sense that they came out of the, uh, the uh, miniature tradition. However, in an age when drawing and painting re were regarded as a polite accomplishment for both men and women, a considerable number of women made visual records of every aspect of Indian life. Many girls had lessons at home, and we learn from their letters that Elizabeth and Mary studied with the painter George Samuel. Botanical illustration was thought a particularly suitable field for women, and one which they virtually took over, encouraged by a wealth of manuals written specially for them. As her surviving work reveals, Elizabeth had painted flowers and plants from her youth. In India, however, her botanical studies gained fresh impetus, and although too few survive, they show a greatly increased skill and sophistication. Can we have the next illustration, please? There it is. You see, it's, it's very, very delicately printed, it's painted. It's not a, a very good reproduction, but the, there's a great deal of um, sophistication in the painting of those leaves and the flowers. Again, um, Elizabeth was not alone in this pursuit. Lady Anna Maria Jones, who married the great scholar of Hindu culture, Sir William Jones, shared with him his fascination with botany and painted plants and flowers. Can we have the next illustration, please? This is her painting of Vanda. Now you see from this, women actually vary considerably in their skills, and this isn't nearly such an accomplished painting as, as Elizabeth's, or indeed one we'll see later. Um, in the first decades of the 19th century in Mauritius in the Indian Ocean, both Lady Frances Cole, wife of the governor, and Annabella Telfair, wife of the supervisor of the botanic garden, painted local plants and flowers. Botanical gardens provided inspiration for many women, and about the same time in Calcutta, Clementina Abbott and Janet Hutton produced striking flower illustrations. Could we have the next one, please? This is uh, by Janet Hutton, and you see she was a much more accomplished painter. And she was also more botanically aware because on the left you have the seed pod burst open, on the right you have a depiction of the stamens. Elizabeth was much more unusual in her series of bird paintings. Partly because of the difficulty of capturing and retaining birds for painting, she had no equal. Could we have the next slide, please? And there is her depiction of, of the purple heron. It's not a, a very good reproduction, but it gives you a sense of the, of, the, of the wonderful sense of composition she had, which is extremely striking. Other women had to be content with paintings by Indians or stuffing preserved birds, often following instructions by the always undaunted Fanny Parks. It was only much later in the 19th century that Margaret Coburn, who was born in India in 1829 and was an amateur ornithologist, painted beautiful and accurate depictions of birds. Next slide, please. Um, I mean, this is, this, this is very accurate painting of, of the bird. She corresponded with Jardin, who was a well-known ornithologist, but you can see how she differs from, uh, from Elizabeth. I mean, she's not nearly as dramatic or striking in her representations. The Madras album contains paintings which also distinguish the sisters from other women artists. Besides botanical paintings, landscapes and buildings were common features of the sketchbook, which every self-respecting lady carried on her travels, including the artist Anna Tonelli, who accompanied Lady Clive and her daughters in India, and Lady Hood, one of the most renowned travelers of the early 19th century. What makes the sisters' work stand out are the studies of Indian figures and groups, sometimes related to religious or social events. Can we have the next slide, please? This is a, a painting by Mary of a, a, a group in a village. You can see somebody in, in the background uh, with, with a bullock. And in the front, they've got this lovely display of uh, fruit and vegetables and flowers. Although many women illustrated their own books, 
it's rare to find such parallels. The written record of Indian experience also favored women. They be became prominent in many fields of writing in Britain in the 18th century, among them letters at which women were thought to excel with their light and entertaining touch. This was indeed proved by the sisters' letters. As with so many letters and journals written in India, they were intended initially for female readership at home, but expected to be passed around a wider circle, providing an informal network for the transmission of information about India. Letters were also often a step into the published world, and the sisters might well have contemplated publishing their letters illustrated with their paintings. Other women frequently followed this route. Maria Graham's Journal of a, <clears throat> sorry, Journal of a Residence in India, published in 1812, was originally written for an, an intimate friend, while her subsequent letters, she illustrated different aspects of Hindu culture. Could we see the next slide, please? That's um, her own drawing subsequently etched by, by a friend of Siva and Parvati. Many other women from the early 19th century illustrated books, their own books with their, their, their paintings and drawings. Informal networks, often based on women, characterized the transmission of information within India. Elizabeth and Mary shared an interest in painting, as did Lady Frances Cole and Annabella Telfair, who were very close friends. The community of women who were interested in Indian culture discussed the latest topics, and Maria Graham relates that it was from a woman friend in Calcutta that she heard about a newly translated Sanskrit poem. Women also provided an informed audience for Orientalist and specialist knowledge to which they had no access through education or the learned societies such as the Asiatic Society, which were established from this time. Maria Graham notes that she consulted leading scholars and was greatly indebted to the renowned Orientalist, Colonel Colin Mackenzie. Elizabeth Willem was taught Indian botany by Dr. Rotler and other experts, both European and Indian. Her sister Mary was a channel of communication for Sir William Jones scholarship when she was asked to provide an illustration for his translation of a Hindu story, possibly Sukuntala, to center relations at home. It was in such ways that women helped popularize Indian culture among a wider audience, both in India and Britain. As I've hoped to illustrate, the sisters were not unique in their interests and achievements. They were, however, exceptional. The quality of both sisters' work was outstanding among amateurs, with Elizabeth's studies of birds in a class of their own. The letters themselves have a particular interest for the contemporary reader. Never edited for publication, they have a freshness and spontaneity which is particularly appealing. Both writing and painting illustrate the special contribution which British women made to the knowledge of India. Well, I hope that's given you a sort of brief overview of, of what was going on around the sisters at, at the sort of time they lived and a bit before and after. And now I'll hand you back to Talika. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Raza, for this enlightening talk on the intellectual lives of women uh, in the 18th and early 19th centuries. Um, and we can see the paintings of bird, fish, and botany, and all of that uh, of interest. Our next speaker for the day is Dr. Kate Smith from the University of Birmingham. Dr. Kate Smith is a senior lecturer in the 18th century history at the University of Birmingham, UK. She researches 18th and 19th century Britain and empire and studies how material cultures were shaped by flows of knowledge, imperial collect connections and global trade. Kate's recent books include Material Goods, Moving Hands, Perceiving Production in England from 1700 to 1830, New Pathways to Public Histories, co-edited with Margaret Finn for Palgrave, The East India Company at Home, again co-edited with Margaret Finn, and British Women and Cultural Practices of the Empire from 1770 to 1940, co-edited with Rosie Daz. Kate's research has been supported by AHRC, Winter Thur, UCL's Center for Humanities, Interdisciplinary Research Projects, Paul Mellon, and Past and Present Society. Kate is currently working on a monograph provisionally entitled Losing Possession in London's Long 18th Century. 
Her talk for the day is titled, When We Had Arrived and Settled Ourselves. Through their presence in a variety of different cultural sites, from the household to the marketplace or riverside, British women encountered and engaged in colonial life on the Indian subcontinent. To respond to and reflect on such engagements, they utilized a range of cultural practices. Such productions have created an alternative historical record of the empire, which is slowly now being unearthed in public and private collections. These sources reveal that British women actively recorded their roles in and responses to Britain's imperial project on the Indian subcontinent. By looking to writings and paintings, as well as objects, acquisitions and displays, we can see how alongside reflecting women's responses, such cultural productions also played a role in shaping broader conceptions of Britain's imperial project and the social, cultural, political and economic worlds of the Indian subcontinent. In this paper, Kate, considers the cultural practices of one individual, Sarah Ellsworth Amherst, to demonstrate the contested and ambiguous nature of the cultural projections she created. With that, I invite Dr. Kate Smith. Over to you, Dr. Kate Smith. Great, thank you ever so much for that introduction, Salika, and thank you um, to Victoria, and Anna and Lauren for inviting me to be part of this round table today. It's wonderful to be part of these discussions. I'm just going to share my screen so that we can see the slides. Okay. So in 1823, Sarah Elizabeth Amherst accompanied her family to the Indian subcontinent, and more specifically to Calcutta, where her father, William Pitt Amherst, took up the post of Governor General. The family remained in Bengal until 1828, and while there, Sarah Elizabeth sought to capture her experiences and encounters in multiple different ways. She drew, painted, and wrote. Kept and preserved over generations, this alternative archive of empire now resides at Claydon House in Buckinghamshire in the UK. In studying how and what Sarah Elizabeth sought to capture and the purposes to which her works were put, we begin to see the complex place such practices and productions inhabited in women's lives, their gendered identities and the broader imperial project. Rather than one-time productions, we, say, we see how drawings, paintings and writings were circulated and repurposed over time. Due to the fact that in their production and consumption these items were deeply social objects, they came to have different meanings and purposes over the lifetimes of the people who engaged with them and beyond. Histories of imperialism have increasingly sought to examine the cultural practices and productions that maintained systems of colonialism in the modern period. Edward Said's intervention, which revealed the latent processes at work within literary texts, remains seminal. Subsequently, material and visual turns have encouraged scholars to place other cultural productions under greater scrutiny. Examining practices such as collecting and writing has taken scholars outside of the colonial archives, allowing them to recognize the different means through which contemporaries constructed the complex power relations that lay at the heart of the colonizing processes. Nevertheless, these studies have tended to focus on the cultural productions created by men with much less attention being given to those of women. The last 30 years has witnessed a shift in the scholarly attention given to the roles played by British women in different imperial spaces. Important early work by scholars such as Claudia Knappmann, Helen Calloway and Marianne Lind focused on white European women in empire, distinctly disrupting understandings of imperial projects as largely masculine in tone, purpose and personnel. In working to understand the roles white women played in empire, these scholars focused on power and exploitation to question whether women were complicit in or resistant to the imperial project. Through this focus, European women often came to be understood as adhering to one end of a binary split that categorized them either as victim or aggressor, while simultaneously obscuring the colonial setting in which they acted. Focusing on white women meant that indigenous people and culture only appeared in the guise they assumed through European eyes. 
The importance of gender was underlined for white men and women, but native populations were rarely gendered, largely excluding colonized women from the concept of woman. Changing understandings of gender, which began to examine gendered identities as relational constructs, challenged work that approached women and feminine identities in isolation. In response, scholars have sought to resituate European women's experiences and identities as existing at the intersections between gender, race, class, and nation. More recent research has continued continued to examine the interdependent and changing nature of gendered, identi de gendered identities in imperial spaces by exploring the experiences of colonized women and examining European women's roles within networks such as missionary projects, the imperial office and kinship groups. Taking this approach has enabled historians to recognize the sets of relationships that govern the lives and identities of men and women and has underlined experiences of gender as highly differentiated rather than universal. The family has emerged as a significant unit of analysis for, for imperial historians. Sexuality and sexual practices have also increasingly been examined to shed light on the intimate dynamics of imperial power. Focusing on the family and sexuality has brought to light the important and complex roles that native women played in imperial life as concubines, mothers and nurses. Such important interventions underline the need to simultaneously reveal and examine the often intertwined experiences of colonized men and women. Such work has underlined the complexity of women's lives in empire and are an inability to remove them from the webs of relationships and spaces in which they operated. Webs that were often simultaneously proximate and maintained across vast distances through textual, visual and material practices. So let's return to those textual, visual and material practices, particularly those that Sarah Elizabeth engaged in in the 1820s. Sarah Elizabeth appears to have been a prolific letter writer and a committed keeper of journals. Writing in her journal on the 24th of January, 1825, she recorded a little expedition taken by her and her mother in order to engage in the genteel and distinctly feminine activity of drawing and painting, as Rosemary uh, mentioned earlier. Sarah Elizabeth regularly wrote about the formalities which shaped their family's official life. Similarly, in recounting the painting expedition, we see how she focuses on the retinue of servants that accompanied them. She recorded how the two women were accompanied on their expedition by all her mother's um, distinctly nameless attendants who carried spears, silver sticks and silver clubs. As Elizabeth Collingham has demonstrated from the later 18th century onwards, East India Company officials strove to legitimize their governance roles by recasting themselves as Indian nobles determined to rediscover India's ancient laws. They appropriated a range of Indian practices to achieve this particular form of legitimacy, such as employing large retinues of servants. However, such grandeur meant that the family was easily recognizable and came under scrutiny. While Sarah and Sarah Elizabeth sought to look out and draw the views before them, rendering the landscapes and ruined buildings in different forms, they also became sites themselves. Along with their retinue, the women were joined on their expedition by a group of country people who offered them vegetables, fruits, fresh butter and reeds of flowers and then followed them. According to Sarah Elizabeth, the women in their drawing and painting practices became a source of speculation. What were they doing? In Sarah Elizabeth's account, she tells us little of how she painted that day. Instead, the account largely focuses on the country people and their gaze. Sarah Elizabeth was primarily interested in how she had become a site and a source of speculation. The journal entry allows us to consider a little further the nature of the paintings and drawings that Sarah Elizabeth created while on the Indian subcontinent, seeing them as deeply social objects. On the January day captured in her journal, we are reminded that Sarah Elizabeth was keen for the opportunities of sketching ruined castles. Her paintings and sketches bound in albums and sketchbooks attest to her interest in this theme, and we see one of these examples here. 
As this took place in the early 19th century, we perhaps should be unsurprised by it. The picturesque and gothic are perhaps at work in these scenes, as are an engagement with themes of decay and decomposition. These paintings spoke to or constructed a sense of the past, but in their creation, they were also deeply shaped by the present. The paintings give no sense of the groups of people that surrounded them as they were painted. But the journal tells another story of a social life interweaved with that of others, of a counter imperial gaze. While in Calcutta, Sarah Elizabeth also sought to capture other buildings as part of her drawing and painting practice. She was particularly keen to capture the exterior of Government House in Calcutta, the family's official residence. While she kept her initial drawings, she went on to make copies of these sketches in pen, and rather than static, these pen drawings were also highly social and mobile entities, traveling back to Britain to communicate with family members and friends there. Research by Kate Telcher, Elizabeth Vibert, Margot Finn, and Sarah Pearsall has revealed that imperial families keenly felt the distances placed between different members and develop, developed a range of strategies to, divert, to traverse spaces of absence. Correspondence and gift giving went some way to mediating a sense of family belonging over time and space. In 1824, Sarah Elizabeth wrote to her brother Fred Frederick, who had remained in England, and included her sketches of their primary residence government house. She did so in the hope that he would better understand the local situation of government house. These sketches were accompanied by written notes which further describe details represented in the drawings. Sarah Elizabeth asked that Frederick not keep the sketches to himself, but rather share them with their half-sisters, Maria and Harriet, to show how the flower garden is laid out. Sarah Elizabeth thus encouraged her brother to respond to the sketches as he would do letters as Rosemary mentioned earlier, as a form of communication that could be shared and read communally. The pen sketches now in the British Library had long lives beyond their moment of production, and in the broader discussion we might want to, to consider their roles in British understandings of empire. Similarly, in 1828, when the family returned to Britain, the sketches and paintings returned with them, so we see them as mobile entities again, as did a series of objects. An 1830 inventory of their family home, Montreal Park, shows us how present these objects and paintings were in the house. While the drawing room downstairs came to contain three ivory and gold pillar and clawed stands and an ivory and gold Indian chair with crimson, crimson velvet seat and footstool to match, upstairs the Indian objects were even more apparent. Sarah Elizabeth's sitting room contained two Indian shell ornaments, a Japan Indian vase, two paintings or prints of Indian views, an Indian tumble, and two Indian whisks, and they're the descriptions in the inventory. As for the Indian women studied by Antoinette Burton, so for the English woman studied here, the material culture of house and home cannot be dismissed merely as memorabilia, but rather needs to be understood as an archival source, from which she constructed and fashioned her own history and sense of self. Despite Sarah Elizabeth proclaiming her hostility towards her exp imperial experiences in her journals, in her sitting room she collated together a group of objects through which she could fashion herself as an individual whose own narrative intertwined with those of other places and people. Yet in including paintings or prints of Indian views and Indian fly whisks in her sitting room, Sarah Elizabeth presented her relationship to those places and people as asymmetrical. Her Indian whisks are particularly significant here as objects of daily use in India, they must have been close at hand, ready to be taken up and flicked around at a moment's notice. Yet rather than Sarah Elizabeth herself, it would have been one of, the retin one of the retinue of servants that she found so troublesome and taxing who would have handled these items, freeing Sarah Elizabeth from the inconvenience of flies and bodily movement. These objects were part of the embodied experience of Indian life and part of the regalia of power. At the same time, by including paintings or prints of Indian views in this intimate yet 
ultimately public space in which she entertained others, Sarah Elizabeth rema reminded herself and others not only of the Indian landscapes, but also of her ability to aestheticize that landscape. As we saw earlier, Sarah Elizabeth was a keen painter and she might have created the two paintings or prints of Indian views displayed in her sitting room. While on one of her, she might have created these while one, on one of her painting expeditions. Yet even if purchased rather than painted, in framing these views and hanging them in her sitting room, Sarah Elizabeth demonstrated that for her, India was there to be seen, known and arranged. And she also creates, I haven't got enough time to talk about it, but she also creates a series of scrapbooks from her time in India. So there's lots of ways in which she's sort of curating and arranging different images. In looking to the journals and letters Sarah Elizabeth wrote, the paintings and drawings she created and the rooms she organized, we might understand her as a lonely figure, writing, drawing, painting, collecting and curating. Rather, I hope to have shown here that the production and consumption of journals, letters, drawings and paintings was often a distinctly social experience. Other people were involved, other people were there at their making and in their use. Moreover, these productions did not have one use. They were made, circulated, collected and preserved over time. Rather than static and singular, they need to be understood within the variety of contexts they existed within over time to examine what they did and meant. In doing so, we begin to see, also see the multiple endeavors British women and men were involved in from maintaining familial links to capturing and reflecting on experiences and that such endeavors were social. Following the traces left in the alternative archives of empire, we begin to see different moments of social engagement and the identities they produced. Thank you. I'm now gonna hand back to Talika. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kate Smith. Uh, it's really fascinating to see the urge of correspondence. And I think uh, rightly, I feel that they've been the great, great, great grandmothers of Instagram and Pinterest. Um, I move over now to our next speaker, Dr. Victoria Dickinson. Dr. Victoria Dickinson is a junk professor, rare books and special collections at the McGill Library. A former museum director, she has over 40 years of experience at senior levels in museums and cultural administration. Dr. Dickinson obtained her PhD in Canadian history from Carleton University in 1995. Her thesis was published by the University of Toronto Press in 1998 as drawn from life, science and art in the portrayal of the new world. Her current scholarly work continues to focus on the visualization and knowledge, cultural and natural histories, and understanding of ideas around place and culture. She has published extensively in museum studies, cultural geography, cultural and natural history, including two books in the renowned animal series and one in the botanical series for reaction books UK and in culinary history. Her topic for the day is Lady Gwillem's China. My plateau and figures are just to their taste. While Elspeth Gwillem preferred to fill her days in Madras with botany and painting, she could not avoid the responsibility of managing a large and socially prominent household. Mary Simons asserted she did the daily housekeeping, but Elspeth ensured that they had furnishings appropriate to their status. She was particularly pleased with her dinnerware, which allowed her to set a fine table. Not only did Lady Quillam appreciate English China, she also had an eye for local productions. Elspeth Quillam's letters allow us also to appreciate domestic material culture, in particular, the dishes and pots fundamental to any household, European or Indian. So to talk about that, I invite Dr. Victoria Dickinson. Over to you, Dr. Dickinson. Thank you very much, Tulika. I'm going to now share my screen. And whoops. 
I'll just go back one. There we go. So Rosemary and Kate have sent the have set the Simon sisters into the social and cultural context of their peers. My contribution is a more tangible exploration of the material context with which they chose to surround themselves. Despite the rigors of the passage and the challenges of establishing a household in what was for them a new country, Lady Gwillem ensured that they would have the comforts of home. Moving to India in 1801 was not for the faint of heart. The passage on an East India Company ship could take anywhere from four to six months or longer if bad weather, repairs, pirates and later attacks by the French delayed the arrival. Elizabeth Gwillem, her husband and sister, Sir Henry's assistant Richard Clark and two Indian servants embarked at Plymouth on the Hindustan in late February 1801, arriving Madras almost five years later on July 27th. Elizabeth does not detail the travails of packing for the voyage, but they were undoubtedly many, as were the annoyances of the voyage. She complains in a letter to her sister Hetty some years later how poorly they were treated by Captain Millet, who overcharged them, did not provide a decent claret, he only gave them sherry and bad port wine. And though the company gave separate leave for that an unlimited quantity of their luggage be placed in the gun room, a dry place, the captain put our things in the hold where they were very damp and injured to get that room for himself. It is evident that the Gwillems brought almost everything they could to set up house. They shipped clothes and books, portraits of their friends and relatives and furniture. Their china likely endured the difficult passage better than many items. In a letter to her sister in 1802, Elizabeth sketches herself from the back, sitting before her writing table, the wall facing her hung with portraits, and on the table, three decorative china vases. China was the name Elizabeth and most British people gave to ceramics, no matter where they were made. The East India Company had imported literally tons of Chinese porcelain into England in the 18th century, and the success of this enterprise stimulated the domestic pottery industry to develop new products, including delicate soft paste porcelains from Bow and Chelsea, stonewares, bone china, and glazed earthenwares like Wedgwood's creamware. The garniture of vases, which you can see on Elizabeth's dressing table, may have been Darby porcelain, treasured pieces from home. And here's a piece, a soft paste porcelain uh, Darby vase with a similar kind of handles to what we can see on Elizabeth's dressing table. In preparation for the voyage, Elizabeth had ensured that they not only had these decorative items, but also sufficient chinaware to set a fine table. Like many of her compatriots, she opted for Wedgwood. Elizabeth likely purchased her tableware in Wedgwood and Byerly's showroom, shown a few years later in this print. In 1763, Wedgwood, Josiah Wedgwood had described his newly developed creamware as, and this is a well-known quotation, a species of earthenware for the table, quite new in its appearance, covered with a rich and brilliant glaze bearing sudden alterations of heat and cold, manufactured with ease and expedition, and consequently cheap, having every requisite for the purpose intended. Though made by other potteries, creamware, also called queensware and later pearlware, became Wedgwood's brand. Thanks to a letter found by Lucy Lead, the archivist at the Wedgwood Museum in the UK, we know that on November the 26th, 1800, only a few months before they were to sail for India, Elizabeth visited the showroom to purchase 12 egg cups for both her breakfast and dinner sets, but then changed her mind and canceled her order. She has since ordered some silver ones and therefore begs that neither of those she ordered yesterday may not be done as she will not want them. This indecision about China versus silver egg cups may have reflected Elizabeth's concern to set an elegant table. According to the Victorian Albert Museum, egg cup sets or egg cruets were an 18th century innovation which reflected the contemporary preoccupation with elegant and refined dining. The earliest recorded egg cup in frame and silver dates from 1740. And we can see here on the right, um, this uh, very elegant egg set. And on the left, uh, quite a lovely porcelain egg cup in a pattern similar to that which Elizabeth, uh, we'll see later, Elizabeth might have had. It was evident, however, that Lady Gwillem had underestimated her need for China. 
Her household consisted not just of the Gwillems and their servants, but also Richard Clark, Sir Henry's clerk and the registrar, as well as an assortment of young men, many the sons of various acquaintances from Herefordshire, sent to India to work for the company or to join the army. Breakfast was often a casual meal, but still required an assortment of cups and plates. In 1802, Elizabeth wrote to her sister in London to ask for more pieces for the breakfast set. She said, I also want from Wedgwood's two dozen plates to match my breakfast set, one dozen small dishes of different shapes for fruit, which is always set here at breakfast, 12 breakfast cups and saucers, 12 coffee cups, muffin plates, any little things, no chocolate cups, several slop basins, bread and butter pieces. I will draw a bit of the pattern, but I fancy they know it, for I told them to write it down. On your right is a small coffee can or coffee cup from the Victorian Albert uh, collections. Unfortunately, the drawing in Elizabeth's letter has not survived, but thanks again to Lucy Lead and to Mary Simon's determination to get the right replacement china, we know what the Gwillems used at breakfast. In 1805, they once again replenished the breakfast set, particularly the tea and coffee cups, and Mary put, took pains to draw the pattern. So she wrote to her sister, I have just recollected one thing you're in great want of, which is some more Wedgwood breakfast cups, tea, coffee, Pray have the goodness to send them two dozen teacups, one dozen coffee cups with saucers and two teapots, I will sketch the pattern. And she did. On the top right, we can see the pattern in her letter to her sister. And on the bottom, we see in the Wedgwood pattern books, thanks to Lucy Lee, pattern 219, which is described as red berries, brown leaves, fine line and edge. That egg cup shown previously gives us an idea of that kind of pattern. Dinner, however, was another matter from breakfast and British society at Madras dined in some style. Elizabeth wrote to her mother in October 1802 that Lord Clive opens a magnificent banqueting house on the 7th with a ball, etc., to the whole settlement. His house and this banqueting house altogether is extremely beautiful and looks like a palace for Priam and his 50 sons. Most dinners were, however, given at home, and Elizabeth refers to her great dinners, where she entertains the governor and others of high rank in Madras society. The Gwillems also entertained their friends, and she notes that to celebrate Mary and William Biss's joint birthday in 1806, they had a gala with 27 at table. Given the climate, people often ate outdoors, and it is worth reading Elizabeth's description from 1802. On the left, by the way, you'll see a Nawab's banquet. Um, this is a mid 18th century Mughal painting. And on the right, a bit later, is a European house in Madras in 1841. And we'll read Elizabeth's description. There are verandas at the back and front of the house. And in these, the dinner is generally laid. The other rooms are called halls and all are used as drawing or sitting rooms. The dinners look very pretty laid out in these verandas, open to the garden, well lighted up. The first dinner I saw, I thought it wonderfully striking, particularly from the immense number of servants waiting with such extreme stillness and so delicately dressed all in white muslins and white or figured turbans and large gold earrings. Besides one's own servants, everybody who dines brings one or two with them so that if we sit down 20 or three or four and 20 to dinner, there are at least 30 servants waiting at table. I think nothing of the kind can exceed the beauty of an evening ride to see all the houses lighted up and people dining or dancing in the verandas with the attendants lying about the garden, particularly at a ball, when if there are 150 people or 200, which is generally the number, there will be 400 or 500 or more of these people in their muslin dresses scattered under the trees before the house. This is the experience Kate Smith has des described for Lady Amherst. Elizabeth was particularly grateful that she had shipped her Wedgwood dinner set. My wedge would have been admired beyond everything for except Lord Clive's, I do not see any Wedgwood, but what looks as if it had been bought in Covent Garden as well for pattern as for shape. So I'm not sure what China Elizabeth was referring to, but she might've been looking at something a little more garish than what her taste would uh, uh, seem to imply. We have on the right an, an illustration of Covent Garden at the time. And here we have a Staffordshire teapot from William Great Batch's factory. We have no re record of Elizabeth's dinner service, but given her comments, it might well have been a restrained pattern. She wrote again that she needed more serving dishes of the best shape for these gala suppers and wrote to her sister in 1802 that Polly, which was another name for Mary, her sister, wrote to you to send me more dishes for our dinner set 
no plates, but a great many dishes, all sizes. One soup tureen, and it must be the best shape, the tall sort. I'm not sure if on the right I found the right sort, but she also wanted salad bowls and vegetable dishes. She didn't need sauce boats. Elizabeth may have been something of a China snob, but she was not alone. Her china was admired not only by her guests, but also by her household staff. They have great pride, she said, in setting out the dinner because everybody brings his own servant with him and it is a matter of conversation. They spare no pains in dressing it with flowers and my plateau and figures are just to their taste. So the plateau was a large tray on which flowers and ornaments could be arranged in the middle of the table. Before she left, Elizabeth had received a gift from Mr. John York, the bishop's brother. He made a present of a most magnificent center for my plateau of cut glass and silver. She also had a likely a selection of figures like this Darby group modeled perhaps after a composition by Angelica Kaufman. So one could imagine the plateau with flowers, fruits, and these delicate figures arranged on it. She was also pleased she had invested in a Darby dessert service. I am glad I brought out China dessert set for here is so much glass that though it costs so much, they do not value it. And here is no China except mine and a few things Sir Thomas Strange has. And you can see on the right, a, um, a glass apernia, something similar to what Elizabeth might've been given, but would have had sweetmeats and fruits in it at dinner. Shortly after their arrival, it was also obvious that the Gillams would require more porcelain. I do not know whether Polly mentioned it before, but I want from the Derby China warehouse 12 plates to match my dessert set and 12 dishes. The dishes must be four of each shape for corners. Here you can see a table layout. This is for the second course, but it's a table layout um, for a service à la française that gives some idea of the requirements for different shape plates. We can only speculate on the pattern for the Gwillem dessert services. Darby made dishes in a wide variety of styles, but here are some, here's an, oct um, an octagonal plate and also a sort of oval plate prepared for the corners. But it might be possible to imagine that perhaps Lady Gwilym had ordered a fashionable botanical service. This decoration on this dish from the Victorian Albert Museum collection is after plate 56 entitled Large Double a Chinese Aster from John Edwards, a collection of flowers drawn after nature which the factory uh, acquired in 1795 or six. Darby had begun to decorate their porcelain with the uh, botanical images from April 8, 1791 on when the factory owner, William Dewsbury II, bought the first 51 numbers of William Curtis's monthly periodical, the botanical magazine, to which Elizabeth herself would contribute as Henry Nolte has pointed out. Elizabeth also drew a Chinese double aster as one of her flowers in her, uh, the few sketches we have that remain. It is remarkable as well that despite the dangers of the voyage and the complications of landing cargo in Madras, the additional China was delivered safely in the summer of 1803. Amongst the innumerable things sent me, I hardly know which to thank you for first, but first to put out of the way the things of little interest and yet of value, my cases of China and of Wedgwood cane without any fractures. And now my sets are very full and complete. Elizabeth and Mary, of course, did not prepare the great dinners. She wrote to her mother in 1804, we have a pariah man, a cook, and he and has a matey. They kill their skin and feather and do everything in a strange way. They cook dinners all in earthen saucepans and earthen frying pans. They have everything to prepare and no one convenience. This painting on Micah, well from Patna in Northeast India, gives an idea of the work of the chef, though in this case, the cook seems to be using blue and white ware. Elizabeth also noted that despite the warm weather, the food was served hot, which required considerable work. One plate each person goes through at the dinner here, it's laid, they all use China water plates, which are set. The water plates are changed. They keep kettles of water boiling outside the house to fill the plates constantly. Again, another image on mica from Patna of the food being served using porcelain or perhaps creamware. Elizabeth's taste for China extended beyond Wedgwood and Derby. Her friend, Mrs. Young, Dr. Anderson's daughter, gave her presents from Malacca, which she sent home with two ginger jars whose contents seem less valuable than the containers. I have two jars of ginger from China I want to send you. The jars look to be pretty. The pair should be kept together. I will send them to you. You can get a common jar and fill it and send it to Mr. Gwillen, keeping one jar for yourself, or if you like, giving my mother a little pot. 
She also remarked on the earthenware dishes that were ubiquitous in Indian houses and markets. We can see in Mary's fine watercolors from the South Asia Museum collection, these pots in use and being transported. In the top right, you'll see there are two pots outside the house and some inside the porch. And then in below, we see the pots being carried. At the festival of Pongal, she described these large pots being used for boiling rice. The pots they use are red earthenware, and on this occasion, the redware is spread on the ground in profusion. It consists chiefly of large pots or vases from five to 10 gallons measure. The parents or elder relatives give to the younger ones on this occasion, one of these pots filled with rice, green ginger, turmeric, a large quantity of sugar cane, fresh cut. The green leaves hang out of the top of the jar and round the neck is tied long wreaths of flowers of golden yellow strung together in their way. It was curious to observe for some weeks, whichever way one went, people carrying these large pots so elegantly adorned with wreaths of flowers. She noted as well that it was the potter, an image we can see on the right, that who was called upon to set a broken limb. These potters make their ware of the same kind of red earth as our garden, po garden pots are made of, but of a finer kind. They first set the bone as well as they can, and then taking a quantity of clay, enclose the limb round the fracture, and for a considerable way above and below. Having done this, they lay it over a slow heat, as great, however, as the patient can bear. And the clay being thus baked round the limb, there is no danger of the bone being displaced. By practice, they know very well how long the bone will be in setting firmly. And when they suppose it to be safe, they break the pot which surrounds the fracture and the cure is performed. While we do not know if Elizabeth managed to ship any red pots home, she did package up the curious light blackware given her by a sweet neighbor, Mrs. Stone. General Smith's daughter. Whether any of these curious pots, which she sent by Mrs. Toppington in the Airlie Castle, survived their passage and continue to be cherished as China from Indian, India is open to additional investigation. Thank you very much. Now back to Talika. That, that was so fascinating. Um, I think all these invaluable sources of information, the letters uh, that you've been talking about and the China where it is really so fascinating because I come from India and I see it on a daily basis. But when I see these letters and the way they've written about it, it's, it's really, really fascinating for me. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Dickinson. I'm sure our audience uh, has a lot of questions and we've already started getting some. Um, I request all the speakers to please switch on their videos so that we can have a round of question and answers. Um, my first question uh, here is to Dr. Raza. Uh, uh, Dr. Raza, do you think that most of the women who came to India in the late 18th and early 19th century would have truly been excited at the prospect of traveling? Or do you think it was just a duty for them which they had to perform uh, because they had to accompany their husbands or brothers or because the polite society demanded that of them. What do you think uh, about that? Uh, please unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes, I thought I'd done it. Right. <clears throat> no, I think, I think the journey out could be very intimidating to contemplate, as Victoria said. Um, a, a lot of ships went down on the way and people lost their lives. But having got to India, I think most people were very excited about it. You know, it had an image of being exotic, unknown, fascinating to go to. Um, for most young women, of course, it was a source of husbands. Um, that was very much a reason for going out. Um, and also husbands who were going to be potentially very rich. A lot of young girls who went there married men who were much older who had established themselves in their careers and were very well off. So it was a great opportunity. Whether they, they looked forward to exploring India as the sisters did, I'm not sure. I mean, I've pointed to a number of women who are absolutely fascinated by, by India, but that was by no means not all women or indeed men. And we learned from the sisters' letters about Madras how boring they found most of society there and how they weren't interested in the slightest bit about what was going on in India. 
and that you find in women's writing for the next decades, that they were a bit exceptional, the writers were, and most of their friends weren't interested in what went on in the native quarter or in India in general, that sort of thing. Um, I think you have to remember as well, did women want to go out to India, that they had a much higher standard of living in India than they did in England. We've seen pictures of these amazing houses that they lived in, huge numbers of servants. And although, of course, the, the governor general would, would have had far more servants than anybody else, the average English person had far more servants in India than they would have had in England, of necessity, of course, because the climate made it essential. But it was a sort of a much more glamorous life that people went out to there. And I think for that reason, most people thought it was a great game, looking forward to get, getting out there. Thank you, thank you. Yes, um, my next question is uh, to Dr. Kate Smith. Um, and well, each question is open to everyone because everybody has their own perspective uh, to it. Um, uh, so in continuation with uh, what we just heard, um, uh, Dr. Smith, what do you think? Uh, did most of the British women who traveled to India, uh, uh, actually most of them, they either mingled with other white women or with servants. And that is what sort of gave them an idea of what they thought was Indian or what is Indian. Uh, for them in that time period. So have you come across any women who mixed freely with the wives of uh, natural Indian elite men, those who conducted businesses with British merchants um, or with wives and daughters of rulers uh, like queens, princesses, or any other such women? Uh, could you please throw some light on these case studies if there are some? And uh, why do you think uh, were most of them limited uh, to their interaction with servants or, uh, or were there people who did interact with others as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks, Tilly, for that question. We see this even with Sarah and Sarah Elizabeth. The, pro the problem is that we're, we always have to read it through their writing and through their perspective. And one of the things that I kind of really notice about Sarah Elizabeth's journals of her time in India is that she reads everything really through a kind of rhetoric around officialdom and formality. So, I mean, I think Rosemary can probably talk to this as well, of course, because other women, so Rosemary mentioned Fanny Parks, the way in which they actually come to describe and understand encounters with elite Indian women is, is different. Whereas Sarah Elizabeth and Sarah, Liz and Sarah and Sarah Elizabeth Amherst, they seem very much kind of embedded in this idea of formality. And I guess, as Rosemary's just mentioned, kind of age really comes into this as well. So Sarah Elizabeth was quite young when she went out to India, lots of women were, and that perhaps affected how they read some of these situations and some of the relationships that they did and did not build. There's also, of course, the, the issue of the fact that they knew they weren't going out there to settle. It wasn't a settler colony. And so their time in India would be temporary, either because, particularly in the later 18th century, because of high mortality rates, or because they knew that they would be traveling home at some point. So I think this these kind of aspects all shape the kinds of relationships and encounters that these women have. <laughs> Thank Lily, you. Could, Thank I, you. could I come in on that? Yes, yes, please. I, yes. Please. Well, there are, there are a number of, of, of factors which actually limited the ability to, to, to meet Indian women. The first were, of course, women lived secluded lives. I mean, you could meet your servants. Normally, they were in your house. You would see people about in the street um, and, and women comment about them the whole time. But women from higher echelons were secluded, both Muslims and Hindus, so it wasn't easy to meet them at all. But it was a subject of great fascination, um, but it was something I actually left out of my talk, but which was very interesting in the letters, was um, uh, Elizabeth and Mary's visit to the Zanana of, of Muslim, uh, a very sort of aristocratic Muslim lady and her, her attendants. And that had always been a subject of a great fascination in, in England. Partly it goes back to Lady Mary Wortley Montague and her Turkish letters when you know, in the early 18th century, she wrote about the way women lived in Turkey. And the whole theme of Muslim despotism and the way they treated women in the Zanana was taken up by Montesquieu. So it was an absolutely fascinating topic. And the first book actually published by a woman on India, written in 1743 by Jane Smart, narrated an encounter with a Muslim lady again in Madras, 
and then Jemima Kindersley wrote about it in 1777. So it was a subject of great fascination, but it wasn't that easy to achieve. And it was people who lived in what they called the Mufassal in the uh, upcountry areas out, out in, you know, in the country. It was often much easier than in Calcutta or Madras, who were much more formal. Bombay was different because you had Parsis and they were far more relaxed and they, they mixed more with the British, but Madras and Calcutta was quite formal. And when you talk about Fanny Parks and Marion Postons, they were in this situation, they were living up country. And also, of course, they were very keen to meet, to meet Indian women. But both of them did meet Indian women on very close and intimate terms. And that's where we have a lot of the source of our information from. And I won't go on about too much, but the, the, the other group of women who were very keen to meet uh, Indian women were of course the missionaries. And they did from the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s in Calcutta, they met Indian women, they were interested in educating them. Um, and no matter what you might think about their agenda, I mean, they actually gave a huge amount in terms of education for Indian women. So there are many different sides to this, but I don't think it's a simple issue. Yes, it's true. true. Just mention um, as well, um, Elizabeth does write in her letters, um, there's a particular excerpt where she talks about her, uh, one of her servants, the, her, basically her maid servant, the person who helps her dress and about her life and how difficult her life has been and how, um, what, what kind of a uh, world she lives in. So she does in fact inquire of her and, and bring this into her letters. She also has a particular friend in Mrs. Stone who is a, um, uh, the, the daughter, the half Indian daughter of Dr. Anderson. Uh, and this is um, something that's very interesting. They talk about that. And she often is talking with Mrs. Stone as well about, um, you know, the, the life of India, that Mrs. Stone has different connections and she can, they can chat about uh, a, a different perception of India through Mrs. Stone. So it's an interesting, um, she does have some opportunity to mm. uh, engage with women in India, but not much. Yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, that, that is a topic I think uh, which one can really uh, see because because of the lack of women in public sphere, I think. So yeah, thank you so much. Uh, the next question is uh, to Dr. Victoria Dickinson. The requirement of China is rather fascinating. It shows that Elizabeth wanted to maintain a typical British household. Uh, now my question is, uh, coming from the times that we are in, whatever we send is bubble wrapped, is packed in plastic and shipped. And in those days when there was no plastic, there was no bubble wrap. And she ordered a whole list of China uh, where to come to India. And that also when she knew that she's not going to live here permanently. How do you think she handled this? How would they have delivered all of this? Did she keep breakage in mind that if I'm ordering like 12, I might get 10 out of them? Or if they break, what will happen? So what do you think about that? Um, well, there's a whole, there's actually, when you um, had given us a preview of some of your questions, I did some more research in this. The great export of English uh, creamware went to North America. So there's a huge um, export to North America, less so to India, from what I can tell, other mm -hmm. than people coming out to India and bringing their China with them or having it shipped. So looking at the shipping of China, um, it came in crates and barrels. So, but the crate was the most common. It was packed in straw. And mm -hmm. so the packing, so Wedgwood would have been quite expert at packing China. And there are all sorts of techniques of doing it. Some, some uh, China shippers packed in seaweed, though that was not what the most professional did according to um, some of the discussions. There is also in the back of my mind is uh, that China was packed in sawdust as well. There was very, I, I looked quite hard to find some images of this. And the only image I could find, which was fascinating was the Peabody Essex Museum in the United States has some wonderful images from China of um, from literally from China of the porcelain trade. And it shows both the making of the China, but also the packing. And you can see that the China is wrapped in a sort of uh, woven mats stacked one on top of the other. And if you've ever seen images of shipwrecks, you'll know that the, the bowls all stack up on one on top of the other. And then it's packed into very large crates and they were packing huge pieces. I mean, very, very large platters, large, you know, punch bowls. You can imagine these coming. 
And these were packed solely into crates. And then um, there's something that's poured in. It could have been rice chaff. It could have been sawdust. It's poured in, often wetted, and then sealed. So that it swells and keeps everything from moving. There was, however, one problem when things were being shipped to Canada. There is a record of, in Elizabeth Collard's wonderful book on uh, pottery and porcelain in Canada, of a crate being damaged, water got in, and because it's in Canada and today here, we would feel it. The uh, straw got wet, froze, and expanded and broke. The ice broke all the china. So yes, there was a huge amount of breakage and people would often order extra. And they would also repair the china they had or even keep the broken cups. There are some wonderful records of people who would keep the broken bits on display in their cabinet. So people would think that they had lots of china, but they would only bring the unbroken <laughs> to sit on the table. So. Yes, breakage is a constant issue with China, but they were very successful in, in shipping China. And as we know from Elizabeth's letters, her China arrived unbroken. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for that. And now we have a lot of questions here. Um, so I, I'll read some of these questions. Uh, while Elspeth did paint and study plants in line with inter interest of botany, she stood out in her serious interest and industrious pursuit of bird paintings. How would this have fit in with her peers who were more exclusively focused on plants and landscapes? How would her ornithological work have been regarded? Might she have been seen as an odd outlier or a novel pioneer by her female peers? Uh, so any of the panelists, please, if you could take this question. Well, I'm happy to start. <laughs> I note that Subu has sent a note to, um, in response to this that um, certainly many of the paintings she did were some of the first paintings of these birds known to science. So she was painting what would be called, uh, might even have been nondescripts, but the first paintings of these Indian birds. Um, I don't think she, she certainly wasn't the first to paint birds. Um, Eliezer Albin published a uh, book of birds in the early 18th century and his daughters were very involved and he credits them with their work on bird paintings. And women did in fact paint birds. Um, there is a Sarah Stone who painted for the Laverian Museum, one of the very best known of the British uh, natural history painters in the 18th century. She was uh, painting birds. Women also did birds in feathers. They made bird paintings out of the feathers of birds. And there, George Edwards, the great bird artist of the mid 18th century had a special instruction in one of his books, Gleanings of Natural History for how to make feather paintings. And a few of these do survive. McGill actually has a couple of Victorian feather paintings where the feathers of the bird are actually glued onto paper in the shape of the bird and, you know, beaks and feet are painted in. So it's a very interesting that women were involved with birds as they were with plants, but I think it is much less common, the painting of birds, than the painting of uh, the botanical materials. Thank you. I think that has answered the question. Um, our next question is from Eleonid Edwards. Uh, she wants to know that did Wedgwood's clients in India influence design developments back uh, in the UK? And she says, I wonder if there were pa parallels in that respect between China and Shins. For example, masters sent out by the East India Company to the artisans to adjust designs. Do you think something like that would have happened? Um, uh, I can start. Perhaps Kate can chip in as well. Um, there the uh, Wedgwood was in fact trying to break into markets in the um, in Asia so he was shipping to Turkey he was even shipping to China he wanted to break into the Chinese market I haven't found much evidence of Wedgwood trying to um, of, of much um, sales of Wedgwood in India though it's an area that I have to say I don't know half as well as I know about North America but I think um, there was always a back and forth, a toing and froing of patterns. And I think there was a lot of influence on um, uh, all, chi all China manufacturers in Britain of uh, Eastern patterns, whether they were coming from China, from Turkey or from India. And perhaps Kate has more information on the Indian patterns. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of back and forth. The one thing that's really kind of shaping 
the manufacturing of ceramics in Britain, as Victoria mentioned before, is, is, is really about kind of making and manufacturing practices and thinking about the materials that they're using, the palettes that they're using, and also thinking a little bit more also about designs. So these things come to really kind of shape the British ceramics industry in the la latter part of the 18th century, and particularly Wedgwood. And those kind of patterns and um, forms of interconnection are coming not only from ceramics, but also, of course, through other mediums. So thinking about the influence of chintzes and cottons on um, on ceramic designs. But in the kind of later part of the 18th century, Wedgwood is also kind of really moving into things like Jasper ware. So actually, in some ways, he's becoming more influenced by um, sort of neoclassical aesthetic than he is by the Chinese and the um, in the and aesthetics from the Indian subcontinent from the kind of 1780s onwards to that kind of final period around at the turn of the 19th century. But I think that's a really interesting question. And in some ways, it'd be great to go back to the Wedgwood archive with that question. I know that he was very um, keen on buying publications, particularly kind of those from China, um, but that's a really interesting question as to whether he was also buying publications and images and designs or engaging at least with designs from the Indian subcontinent. There is, a, there is another way in which India influenced design in, in this country in the early 19th century through blue and white wire, because it was estimated that practically everybody had some relation in India by the early mid 19th century. So people were terribly interested to see scenes of India. And as you know, there were extensively um, people drew and painted India, which were turned into illustrations for books and also prints. And these prints were often used for blue and white wares that were made in Staffordshire. It wasn't particularly expensive. It was for the sort of middling classes to use, but you get a huge range of prints in India derived from Williamson, his Indian sporting scenes, the Daniels. I mean, there were any number of people who did paintings of India and there it turned up on your dinner plate at home. So there's a, I mean, I collect it myself, which is, <laughs> I know that it, you don't see it in the background in this room, but it's the background in another room. So that was a way that India actually did come home on, on English ceramics, which was, fun to collect anyhow. It, ha it came in Canada as well. There are all sorts of Canadian scenes, particularly winter scenes mm. on transfer printed blue and white uh, wear. So yes, lots of that here. Yeah, I think they did it for the United States as well. I mean, whenever they saw an opportunity to sell using a, a local you know, picture, they would use it. Right. Right, thank you, thank you. Um, another question for Dr. Smith. Did Lady Amherst and others distinguish between British and Indian servants? One reason for the large retinue in India, as we learn, is the letter. It, as we learn in the letters, uh, was that a servant at that time did only one thing and one thing only. So, to the community at large, was there a different attitude to petty theft in an Indian household as opposed to the British, who brought with them the expectation that servants might steal? Mm. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. There's definitely a disconnect between kind of British understandings of servants and their roles, and then the ways in which particularly kind of British women encounter them in households um, on the Indian subcontinent. So a way in which we see this, for example, you mentioned that um, servants on the Indian subcontinent, the idea is that they are, they, they have one particular role, and that's one of the reasons for these kind of vast retinues of servants. In Britain at this time, we're kind of moving towards a moment where households, of course, have much more specialised spaces and we're moving towards the idea of servants venturing up back staircases rather than kind of being front and centre within the houses. And one of the problems that the Amherst seem to encounter, particularly a government house, is the idea that government house is actually a much more free flowing space in which spaces can be used for lots of different purposes. And so this is one of the things they, this is one of the problems that they register with servants. And this seems to be one of the issues that they encounter. Um, they don't, I haven't come across a, an incident in which they talk particularly about theft. I mean, it's interesting to, in terms of thinking about kind of British relationships to servants, particularly around the turn of the 19th century. This is a period in which 
there's lots of you know, as Carolyn Stephen has shown, there's lots of jokes around servants in Britain, but there's also lots of, con and, and servants sort of perform this role in Britain at that time as a kind of way of, um, as a way of uh, almost commentating on social relationships more broadly. But at the same time, this is a moment where servants are actually able to kind of make arguments for their own importance and for the kinds of roles that they play and um, for for better kind of economic entitlement because they can just up and leave, of course. And this is something that this is a, a, a card that they play. So I think it's it's more of a kind of question of, actually there's lots of moments when these British families come to the Indian subcontinent where their sort of, their whole understanding of servants and servants roles is something that's perhaps challenged and we particularly see this in in sorry my dog's barking in the background we particularly see this in um official in official and more official families i think this kind of disconnect between understandings as to what servants roles actually are and the kinds of relationships that they have with them but it was interesting victoria you were mentioning about um elizabeth Gwillem and her kind of relation her more particular relationship to her lady's maid and i think we also see this with you know, there's then these kind of very particular roles ladies made or ayahs and the ways in which they become part of families and often, of course, return back with these East India Company families, although then there's a kind of real problem of these women essentially kind of becoming destitute because they're sort of abandoned by their British families once back in Britain. So there's lots of different relationships going on there um, and misconceptions or um, slight misunderstandings perhaps or just different understandings as to the kinds of roles that that need to be played and are played. One of the things that fascinates me and I, I, I there's just a one mention in Elizabeth's first letter is that she embarks at Portsmouth with her she says I like my two black servants very much mm -hmm. and so she's obviously bringing Indian servants back to India as, you know, there's no other mention. She doesn't continue this on, but it's an interesting um, point where she, um, you know, has, is bringing, has obviously engaged these servants in, uh, in England. The only other um, mention which I find fascinating is Mary, who was of course very, um, very different personality. And Mary complains bitterly. She's the housekeeper, the sort of chatelaine. And she says, they're, you know, they're always pilfering the supplies and the particularly vinegars. They just love the vinegars and I can't keep them in, in stock. And so she, so this taste that her, the Indian servants have developed for some British foods and Mary's constant complaining, she has to keep that under lock and key, but everything else is okay, right? <laughs> so. I, think, I think you have to remember how very dependent the British were on their servants. It wasn't the same relationship as it was in, in, in Britain. I mean, they were coming to a country which, from a European point of view, had lots of problems of health, disease. An awful lot of people died very, very young, you know, men, women in childbirth. They were enormously dependent on the people in their house to show them how to manage, actually. And this is particularly marked with ayahs. The people formed very, very close, close relationships with, with, with ayahs, perhaps even closer than you might have done in England. So I, I don't think it was necessarily a distant relationship. I think it could be a very, very close relationship, which lasted for years and often continued when they went back to England. And we see that also, of course, we kind of into in business terms as well. That it's not just about kind of household, um, household servants in which those kinds of relationships are built and are particularly kind of built over, as you say, long periods of time, thinking about kind of men of business. Right, and um, thank you, thank you for that. Uh, it's nearly nine o'clock, uh, sorry, nine o'clock in India, uh, 9 p.m. <laughs> yes, um, uh, yes, that's the clock that I have in front of me right now. So yes, it's about an hour and a half. Uh, and it was such a wonderful session about the intellectual lives of women. And, uh, and I feel there's a lot more uh, that uh, now I want to look into and research on and find out more about the relationships that existed between women uh, and uh, if they could really come as close as friends and, uh, uh, and uh, create more intellectual discussion with each other. Uh, so thank you very much for this, uh, this wonderful session. And I hand the session over back to Lauren. 
I really uh, thank the Gwilym Project, all members, for bringing us together here today. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Talika, and thank you very much to all of our panelists for your fascinating presentations today. And thanks to all of you for attending this session of Gwilym Online. We look forward to welcoming, welcoming you to our upcoming presentations. Please mark your calendars for our next session on Tuesday, November 17th at 9 a.m. Montreal time, when we will hear from members of our student research team, Serafina Masters and Hannah Nechevich, as well as Marika Sardar of the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto, and Ben Cartwright of the South Asian Collection, so, sorry, South Asian Art Collection Museum in Norwich, as they discuss the sisters' artworks, their painting practices, and their inspirations. Finally, I would like to welcome McGill Library School student Miles Brown to the Gwilym Project team. He will be helping to coordinate the remaining seminars in our Gwilym Online series, so members of our research network will likely be hearing from him soon. Merci de, de votre présence aujourd'hui, and we look forward to welcoming you again in two weeks to Gwilym Online. <laughs>